Absolutely. <laughs> I'm an honorary surgeon now. I know more about surgery than I actually care to know about surgery, <laughs> particularly 7 a.m. grand rounds. <coughs> They're a killer. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. It's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Klotman, who is the R.J. Reynolds Professor of Medicine and Chair of the Department of Medicine. Um, Dr. Klotman has very strong Duke roots. For those of you who don't know, she's um, been a Blue Devil uh, since her undergrad years, where she uh, completed a degree in zoology and then stayed for medical school, residency, and fellowship training in infectious disease. Joined faculty as an assistant professor prior to going to the NIH, where she worked with uh, the esteemed um, Robert Gallo, who was uh, involved or with... Or infamous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, or both. Or both. Um, so, uh, and then after, after many years at the NIH, went to Mount Sinai, where she quickly rose to the ranks um, and chaired the Division of Infectious Disease there for um, over a decade, as well as uh, co-directed the uh, Center for Global um, Health and uh, Emerging Pathogens prior to, prior to being recruited here in 2010. Um, before the conference, Dr. Klotman and I were talking about how many um, new positions she's helped fill uh, in the department. I think she's actually done a great job uh, leading that. And What's been nice for us to see from the Division of Nephrology is the work she's done in um, HIV nephropathy. And she'll describe, I think, perhaps one of the few exceptions in science where um, clinical science findings can go straight to guidelines without intervening randomized trials. So I hope you join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Kotman. Thank you. Actually, I, I had this brilliant idea for title. Um, about two minutes before I had to get the title in. Same talk that I, I gave, actually, for similar to the medicine research conference, and, but I don't think too many of you make it across the street. But I, I did realize that what I'm going to tell you is a story in which actually all of the evidence suggested what the therapy should be, and it rapidly became unethical to have a randomized clinical trial, and that is for the treatment of HIV-associated nephropathy. But I'm going to tell you, the, this is really a story of the scientific evidence laying the groundwork for jumping right to guidelines um, and not going through a randomized controlled trial. And I'll, I'll show you some of the data um, that we were involved with that, that really um, helped make that case. I'm going to start with just introducing my research team. Um, I'm very proud that we are in the 14th year of a program project grant. And it's a, it's a real collaboration across disciplines, across institutions. Um, some of it's because we've had this kind of spreading out, um, certainly, of my team. But it started at, at, uh, with a collaboration between Mount Sinai and Yale at the time in their genetics department. Now includes Duke, of course, and my husband, who's at Baylor, Mount Sinai, and Columbia. So it's a real collaboration, and it's a scientific, uh, it's a collaboration of disciplines. It started out heavy into molecular virology, which is my field, but also had to rapidly include cell biology and genetics, which is a real interesting part of the story, and certainly pathology. And we've had been privileged to have probably the world's leading um, renal pathologist, Vivette Degatti, on our team for the whole time. And then it also, uh, an essential part of this collaboration has been uh, clinical core with clinical investigators both in the States and in Africa. And then um, every time we've gone in for resubmission, we've really had to think about, well, what are, the, what are the real core support elements that we need? And it's changed with each submission. And most recently, it's been a real significant informatics core um, because that expertise has far exceeded any of our ability uh, to analyze even the data that we generate in our labs, not to mention the clinical data. So this is my research team, and, and we still collaborate. We met up um, in New York two weeks ago and had the interesting conversation that we've actually, th the disease that we start to, started on initially is no longer an issue. And that's, a, you know, that's victory, um, unless you're trying to keep funding going. But, but actually, it's really opened up a whole new avenue of research that I'm going to tell you at the end, and really which is how research should go. So this story goes back to the very early part of the HIV epidemic, when certain parts of the epidemic were reporting a new entity of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, um, and it wasn't coming out of every site. It was largely coming out of centers that had large population of, of African Americans, um, as opposed to Caucasians with HIV. Um, and so uh, at NYU in New York, for instance, they reported that 10% of their HIV patients had this entity. 
Um, and it was a very dramatic presentation of rapidly progressing um, end-stage renal disease, largely characterized by significant proteinuria, nephrotic range proteinuria. Um, at the beginning of the epidemic, there was a lot of debate between the West Coast and the East Coast. Was this just really um, IV heroin related? Uh, because there had been longstanding renal disease associated with the use of IV heroin. But the epidemiology rapidly supported something that was quite different and independent from the use of, of heroin. And so it became known as HIV-associated nephropathy, or HIVAN. Um, and it, it has been and continues to be the most common cause of chronic renal failure, failure in HIV-positive positive black um, men, and now actually black women in the US, occurs exclusively in blacks worldwide. Um, and even if somebody self-reports that they're Caucasian, if you take a good history, they, they clearly have an African um, relative. And so that clearly suggested that there was a genetic component to this disease. It was originally recognized as a manifestation of late stage um, HIV. But what I'm going to show you is the disease phenotype has clearly changed. And we had some of the cases uh, that we reported very early on in newly diagnosed HIV patients. And it's clearly that antiretroviral therapy has changed the disease. Um, and that's, the, that's without the randomized control study. But we do know that all, although I can claim that there has been been um, victory in the states relative to this disease. That's certainly not the case in Africa. Now, it wasn't reported as a big issue in Africa because largely HIV uh, positive patients were dying earlier of things like tuberculosis. But when you look at, at, uh, at surveys, particularly ones done in association with clinical trials, there's clearly widespread renal dysfunction in anywhere up to 20% of patients that are enrolling in clinical trials. So we know that represents probably the tip of an iceberg of what will be uh, significant renal disease uh, probably in Africa as well. But the, the real diagnosis came from biopsy. And um, it's, it's really interesting institution to institution, the culture of biopsy. Some institutions like Hopkins will biopsy you if you walk in a, a renal clinic, um, whereas other institutions don't biopsy at all. So, so there may be under reporting of this disease based on, on on institutions that didn't do biopsy. But this is kind of the classic finding. So, so by, by ultrasound, there are large kidneys. And that's quite distinct from other causes of chronic kidney disease. And then by, by microscopy, the histology shows this collapsing FSGS with cystic dilatation of the tubules, which you can see here, often filled with protein. Um, leukocytic infiltration, interstitial nephritis. I'm going to leave this off because it keeps going off. And then a profound Podocyte proliferation. In fact, sometimes it's so striking that it, that it looks almost malignant, but it is not a, a transformation. So contrast that as a classic case of hive to what somebody might see in 2013. This was from my colleague Christina Wyatt at Mount Sinai, who runs our clinical core. This is a 30-year-old Hispanic uh, black male who had non-nephrotic uh, proteinuria when he presented. He was on antiretroviral therapy and, and responding quite nicely with no detectable plasma RNA. But he did have uh, renal disease. And so he had some of the elements of the classic HIV nephropathy, um, but didn't have the collapse, the glomerular collapse, or the microcystic tubule dilatation. And because the original syndrome was based on a, a, a constellation of findings, raises the question, is this HIV-associated nephropathy? I'd say this is HIV-associated kidney disease, um, whether you want to call it nephropathy or not. Um, so in terms of understanding the pathogenesis of the disease, we took a, a several different uh, approaches. The first was working in in vitro culture systems, particularly in primary renal cells, um, making multigenic and single gene constructs to really understand which genes drive this disease. We were very fortunate that transgenic modeling has worked beautifully for this disease. Just to give you a little background, um, there's no sm small animal model for HIV. And that has really gotten in the way of some of the work, particularly in terms of vaccine development. Um, because the, the receptor and co-receptor required for HIV are st distinctly human and not found in the murine model. And you can make transgenics with a number of, of the cell surface proteins. But it's very hard to get a replicating system unless you reconstitute that animal with human cells. But it turned out you make a transgenic mouse, that is, you put the, most of the genome in the mouse, they get renal disease. So that really gave us an avenue to study this disease. 
Um, we also established early on human cohorts wherever we could get good collaborations going, and that provided certainly an opportunity to biobank renal biopsies, um, which I've learned a lot about. We, we actually ended up going down to the renal clinic and holding our, our um, formaldehyde in order to get the specimens because uh, processing was, was so important. Um, but we also create a biobank of urine and blood. And then lately, we've developed these very large omic databases, which are, are growing exponentially and daily. So this was the, the original transgenic construct that we worked from. It was basically the whole viral genome. It's a very small viral genome. We know more about each single base in this genome than any pathogen ever known to man. But the, the, the transgenic was originally deleted of two essential genes, GAG and POL, because of the fear of, of viral replication. And what happened when this, the other thing we did is, is then take the same background and you can delete genes, you can put, and it doesn't show up, and you can put indicator genes. So you can make a lot of genetic constructs in mice from single, single um, genes, multiple genes, to understand the interaction between the viral proteins and the, the disease. So basically, if you take that whole viral genome and you put it in an animal, it gets what looks pathologically identical to HIV in, in humans. And this has been reproduced in rat transgenic models. It's been reproduced in a number of, of labs. It's been, it's been reproduced in several different lines, so it's not related to where it's actually integrated. So this really helped us unravel the, the disease. And this probably summarizes about 20 publications, but th this is the essential elements. First of all, that expression of HIV as a trans gene recreated the clinical phenotype. Then there we had these reciprocal transplantation studies, elegant, that showed the disease actually transplants with the kidney, as opposed to a normal kidney in a transgenic background. Pathologic features were dedifferentiation, proliferation, and then transgenic modeling really supported <laughs> the role of NEF and VIF genes. Okay, so this is minimal change disease. This is a marker for differentiation. So you can see in minimal change disease, you get nice distribution, absent in high van. So that's de-differentiation. And then proliferation with KI67. So those are the hallmark. So one of our big breakthroughs was demonstration in renal biopsies that you see HIV RNA here. And you can, oops. You can see, oopsies, I've lost the full screen. So you can see in renal epithelial cells, you have multiple positive, thank you, multiple positive cells. And in renal podocytes, you have multiple positive cells throughout the kidney. And also you can see that if you look by, by DNA in situ PCR, you see viral DNA matching the same cells that you see viral RNA. So this was really the first demonstration that viral nucleic acids in the kidney. So why did it take so long? Largely it's due to, to preservation of the biopsy. They've got to be acquired very rapidly and fixed, otherwise the RNA degrades. The other interesting thing is when we did this study, these patients all had renal disease, but they didn't necessarily have high van. And so the majority of patients with HIV have viral nucleic acid in the kidney. So not everybody that has high van, not everybody that has HIV in the kidney has high van. So it's required but not sufficient enough to give the full manifestation of the disease. Again, suggesting there's probably a second element, which we now know to be the genetic predisposition. The other important point is we couldn't find viral nucleic acid in all patients. And we don't know whether that was because it degraded or some patients actually don't have direct infection of renal cells. But this was all quite surprising at the time because renal epithelial cells are not known to have a, the co-receptor and receptor for HIV. So they're largely CD4 negative. They're largely co-receptor negative. And, and so it took a lot of convincing that actually these cells were infected. We used multiple ways to do it. The other way we did is we actually laser captured, dissected these cells out of the kidney then reamplified HIV as another modality to demonstrate the presence of the virus. And if you look very closely, when you find a renal epithelial cell that's positive, generally all the cells 
and that tubular positive. And that gives you a little hint as to how the virus might be spreading in the kidney, suggesting it's cell-cell spread uh, most efficiently. So I want to tell you a little bit about a case study that we did at the time that we were developing the ability to do in situ hybridization. And this was actually one when I was on, which was, it, it, it's kind of luck, because I, I only did a couple of months a year, and sure enough, one day I was, was rounding, and they presented me a 30-year-old black male who presented to the emergency room with fatigue, weight loss, night sweats, rash, and really impressive adenopathy, so much so that he was admitted with a diagnosis of Hodgkin's, which is astounding in New York in the, in the middle of the epidemic that somebody would misdiagnose this as Hodgkin's. But they did because the adenopathy was so impressive. When you took a good history, had multiple sexual partners. In fact, he was getting tested every couple of months. And he had been seronegative three and six months before presenting. But now his serology was actually quite high. I mean, I was very suspicious. He had acute, he had primary HIV infection and presented with that. He had very high copy number of HIV RNA, and he had rapidly progressive renal failure. In fact, he had 12.5 grams of protein, um, and he actually ended up on dialysis within the first week. But we decided to start antiretroviral therapy. Now, you've got, you've got to take a mindset of 2001. The indications for therapy were really if you had a CD4 under 200. These guidelines have changed very rapidly in the last 10 years. So we decided to try antiretrovirals early, even though his CD4 count was still pretty high, because we just had a feeling that this, this might help. It was such a dramatic um, presentation. And we had an IRB-approved protocol that allowed us to biopsy him before initiating therapy. And this is a biopsy about three months after therapy. So clinically, he had almost complete recovery of his renal failure, came off dialysis, and down to less than 0.5 grams of protein, very dramatic. And then pathologically, he had, he had significant recovery, so you no longer see the big dilated tubules, but he still had some scarring of the kidney that was residual from his initial presentation. So even though this was a single case, New England Journal took it because it was so dramatic, and it was the only demonstration, and to this date, the only pre- and post-biopsy demonstration that antiretroviral therapy presumably had a significant impact. Now, one could argue that some of his renal failure was acute tubular necrosis, and that would have, have recovered, um, but he really had pathologic recovery as well. And in fact, with some special staining, you can still see some res the residual scarring, but again, you lose the dilated tubules and the proteinuria. So this is a case that is report that is quoted over and over again in the guidelines, some of the justification for changing the guidelines to treat HIV patients with antiretrovirals. Now, the other interesting part of our, our um, study of this patient, looking pre and post by in situ hybridization, this is his pre-biopsy that has a lot of positive tubules. And what, in retrospect, is not surprising is post-treatment, even though he's recovered, he's still got a lot of viral RNA in the kidney. Why? Because antiretrovirals do not clear that infected kidney. They, they prevent the whole viral life cycle. But if you have integrated DNA that's making RNA, the antiretrovirals will not affect that. So that really started to raise the issue for us, is, is the kidney a long-term reservoir for HIV, independent of whether it causes actual clinical disease? Um, and that's a big issue right now, because people are starting to talk about cure. We'll talk a little bit about what some of the ideas are there. We were able, with several of the biopsies from a number of patients, to actually look at the virus in closer detail that's in the kidney. And this is a genetic analysis we did using laser, laser capture of those epithelial cells that are positive, taking out the DNA, sequencing the viral DNA, and comparing it to peripheral blood DNA. So we were asking, what does this site and virus evolution this site have to do with peripheral blood. And basically what this analysis has shown, so if you look at a single patient, so it, this is one patient in green, one patient in red, the PBMC sequences are genetically distinct from the kidney sequences, but highly related. So that indicates that, as you might expect, a, an individual we now know gets l infected largely with one virus, largely. Now, multiple partners, you can get reinfected. But that what happens over very rapid uh, time courses, you have evolution of the virus. And you generate thousands of quasi-species. 
which are highly related but genetically distinct. And so what this suggests is you have peripheral blood circulating with virus, probably travels through the kidney, but within the kidney, you then have a compartment that supports separate virus replication with different evolutionary pressure. A significant observation because, again, it, it suggests that this organ supports virus replication that's different from peripheral blood. So we can conclu conclude a lot from the human studies. First, that HIV does infect renal epithelial cells, um, and that's been validated by a number of labs. Um, that the viral nucleic acid can be there without HIV-in. And so that suggests to us that Caucasians can have, in fact, some of the biopsies were from individuals that were Caucasian that didn't have HIV-in, can have virus in the kidney. They may not get kidney disease, but it still raises an issue that this is going to be a significant uh, reservoir when you're trying to cure patients of HIV. We, as well as others, really started to believe that H specific antiretroviral treatment does alter the clinical course of HIV-in. And then, of course, if the virus evolves separately in the kidney, again, suggesting a unique compartment. And in fact, when we were doing these studies, the, a lot of the databases did suggest that antiretroviral therapy across the population was has, having a significant change in what is here, the incidence of patients that are HIV positive with end-stage renal disease. You can see that from 90 to 95, this was on a, a really quite remarkable trajectory up and really dramatically plateaued when in 95 you had the introduction of multiple different antiretrovirals available that really started to impact the epidemic. Now you notice this plateaued, and I haven't gotten the most recent numbers, but it stayed stable for some time. Why? Because the population at risk for HIV-N was increasing, which are African Americans. So you had an increasing population at risk even though antiretrovirals seem to have an impact, your risk pool was increasing. And then you're also keeping patients alive longer. So if you look at prevalence, that number was increasing, but it was increasing at a slower rate. So epidemiologically, it really looked like heart had an impact on at least new cases of end-stage renal disease. And then there were a number of cohort studies, retrospective studies, comparing populations to really suggest that antiretrovirals decreased incidence but also impacted outcome in patients with HIV and renal disease. And in fact, there was never a randomized control study. Basically, if you look at three or four sets of the guidelines that started to change, they quoted the strong preclinical evidence that viral genes actually recapitulate the disease in the transgenic model. There was the, the frequently quoted uh, John Winston, uh, Mary Klotman case from Mount Sinai case of one, um, certainly stabilization of the incidence of end-stage renal disease and then a large number of retrospective cohort studies. And so what you saw over in, in fact in 2005, it basically, you know, it appears the virus causes the disease and therefore we should treat. So some things just become so obvious. Um, it might have been different if the antiretrovirals had major, major toxicities as they did initially or we weren't seeing such dramatic effects from them. But anyway, what happened over the course of from 2005 to 2007 is that our, our guidelines changed to um, indicate that patients with HIV should always be screened for renal disease. If they have any re evidence of renal disease, they should be treated with antiretroviral therapy independent of their CD4 count. Now, if you fast forward to 2013, we're recommending treating everybody. and in if you look back, you say, of course, the virus causes disease. But this is a, you know, over a time period where drugs were getting better, they were getting easier to take, and we were having an increased understanding of some of the non-immunodeficient complications of HIV, even in the presence of CD4s over 500, that HIV itself was causing significant end organ damage. Um, we could have another whole seminar about that, particularly relative to cardiovascular disease, but with renal disease, with bone disease, and other long-term manifestations. So now it's recommended, particularly in Western countries, that all patients with HIV, unless they have a major contraindication, be treated with antiretroviral therapy, but where resources are limited, that the presence of renal disease be an indication to start therapy.
So at that point, we might have said, OK, so much for the program project. It's, it's over. Just want to remind you that, that actually, um, even though the incidence has stabilized, we still see increased prevalence in, and for the reasons that I told you. But there is a changing spectrum of chronic kidney disease in HIV that's not quite as dramatic as HIVIN, but long term may have significant consequences. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. This is a study done by my clinical colleague, Christina Wyatt, at Mount Sinai. And she simply looked at the proportion of biopsies with classic HIVIN from 1998 till 2007. And as you can see, you know, in the late 90s, about half of the biopsies were still HIV associated nephropathy with the classic uh, findings. But that changed quite dramatically, um, where it's really a mixed picture now when you can get biopsies. And so late 90s, early 2000s, we were still doing biopsies at Mount Sinai. And if you look at the primary diagnosis in those biopsies, a broad spectrum of kidney disease, many of these are diseases of an aging population. So diabetes, certainly, hypertension, but a number of other diseases, allograft rejection. So Sinai was one of the sites that participated in the original transplant protocol uh, for HIV patients, and now that's being done at many, many centers. And then certainly a lot of drug toxicity, which isn't necessarily going away. And in fact, we had another uh, opportunity to look at kidneys. This is a very interesting um, cohort called the Manhattan Brain Bank. Um, this was a study set up to look at HIV-associated neurologic disease. And it was a rapid um, autopsy protocol because you get so much degradation um, before you have a chance to really look at the brain at the time of autopsy that in order to, to really get a better look at that disease, there were protocols set up to to um, consent patients with what were considered end-stage manifestations of HIV for rapid autopsy at the time of death. And um, patients really signed up for this, um, particularly ones that had been in long-term care and really trusted their provider. So we had the opportunity to look at 137 autopsies, 89 um, donated kidneys, and they were blindly reviewed by Vivette Degatti for pathology. And so these were not these were not coming to us because they had kidney disease. It was just sort of an indicator uh, of kidney disease in a population that had end-stage HIV. And if you look, there was quite a bit of kidney disease, as, as you could imagine. 84% of the cases had evidence of kidney, kidney disease. But again, HIVAN was only a small number that you, you had evidence of other chronic diseases. So clearly, HIV is associated with a spectrum of renal diseases. HIVIN was kind of the classic cause and effect. You express a viral gene, you get the disease. But I think a more interesting question now is, does HIV have a different spectrum, particularly in the setting of other diseases of aging? So this is the SMART study. I don't know if many of you know about this. This was a study done several years ago. One of the bandwagons for a while for HIV was to consider protocols where you could give patients therapy, their CD4s would go up, and then you would stop therapy. So they were scheduled interruptions. Um, turned out that this protocol was stopped prematurely because it, it's not such a good idea. But what happened um, is as patients came off therapy, some of them did OK. Some of them, their CD4s fell quite rapidly, and they had opportunistic infections. But one of the more interesting observations is there were an increased number of non-AIDS events suggesting that the virus itself was causing non-immunodeficient complications, particularly end organ complications, particularly cardiovascular events and renal disease. So again, suggesting that in the setting of HIV, there is end organ damage that's probably not related to a primary uh, immune deficiency. And now we think it's probably related to chronic inflammation, which is a catch for a lot of different things. But um, this is obviously a, a very important area for continual research. And if you look at RFAs coming out for HIV, this is a big area, and particularly in cardiovascular. And I know that, that Eric uh, Velasquez and, and several of your colleagues have been interested in answering some of these RFAs. We're very interested in the intersection between HIV and chronic renal disease. And in fact, um, again, my colleague Christina Wyatt and Si Jang He uh, looked at a veteran's aging cohort. And they wanted to know 
what was the rate of progression to a GFR under 45 in a cohort of HIV positive, um, diabetes negative, HIV negative, diabetes positive, and HIV negative, diabetes negative cohort. And they had the, the VA um, database is huge. They had 31,000 patients. 7% um, of them met the endpoint. And when they looked at the rates of progression, they found that the presence of both HIV and diabetes had a markedly increased progression to renal disease compared to diabetes alone and compared to HIV alone. Again, suggesting the intersection between diabetes and HIV in accelerates the rate of progression. And then Si Zhang He on our program project was able to model that in transgenic modeling. So if you look at our TG26 mouse, which is the, carries the HIV transgene, and you induce diabetes, you get significantly more proteinuria at a faster rate than if you don't have diabetes or if you have, di if you have diabetes without the HIV transgene, suggesting there's this interaction between HIV and diabetes that's going to be important to look at. So some of the remaining questions that we've really been focused on, one is certainly how does the virus get in these unusual cells in the kidney? And we were struck by, this is in situ hybridization now, looking at the interstitium of those biopsies, where you have a huge number of lymphocytes. And if you notice here, those lymphocytes are like the Trojan horse carrying HIV into the kidney. So with that picture in mind, we um, hypothesize that probably it's a direct uh, transfer of the virus from the T cell to the renal epithelial cell. So we, we made nice green fluorescent virus to really model this out. Um, and using a co-culture system where we had infected CD4 positive cells with labeled renal tubule epithelial cells, and we co-cultured them, we found you could dramatically transfer virus to the renal epithelial cells as long as those cells were touching. And so you didn't need a viral co-receptor um, to get transfer of the virus. And in fact, we've been able to show that not only do you transfer virus from an infected T cell to a renal tubule epithelial cell, but that renal tubule epithelial cell then can transfer the virus back. So we think what's happening in the kidney is you're getting ping pong back and forth of the virus within the kidney, and that's why you have separate viral evolution. And in fact, this really nice uh, um, fr uh, frame photography, you can follow the viral particle from the nice green T cell into the red epithelial cell and actually see the formation of that synapse and see the transfer of the virus. So that's important because it really does tell us that infected T cells can transfer virus even if you're not detecting virus necessarily cell-free in the plasma of patients. You may have dynamic exchange in the kidney, if, particularly if antiretrovirals are not as effective in the kidney. So again, suggesting this is a very unique reservoir for the virus. The other outstanding question um, that remained so until about four years ago was why is Hyvan a disease that only affects um, those of African descent? So we were putting that transgene in different breeds of mice and we're able to show in some breeds of mice you got 100% penetrance of the disease and some breeds you didn't. And our geneticists were doing these very, very laborious crosses to try to understand and map. And the human studies beat us, basically. So using admixture studies, um, Jeff Kopp uh, at NIH and then another group were able to show that there is a risk allele, a, ris a risk loci and two risk alleles for Hyvan. And they are both within this APOL1 gene. And what is really interesting is it turns out that's a risk disease for a number of renal diseases that are higher in blacks than in whites. So if you look at FSGS, hypertension, sickle cell nephropathy, and even just progression of chronic kidney disease, that having those alleles markedly increases your probability of having the disease or increases progression of chronic kidney disease. And the nephrologist can tell you a lot more about it. The bottom line is nobody knows why yet. APOL1 is an autophagy gene, but nobody's quite put together that um, in vitro function
of ApoL1 and with this profound genetic predisposition for kidney disease. And in fact, with HIVAN, it, in, it gives you a 29-fold increased risk. And if you're HIV positive with a high-risk genotype, that is both alleles, the risk of adding HIVAN is 50%. So it's quite dramatic. Now, why has ApoL1 been maintained in the African population? This is a great story. It, it's like sickle cell disease. Um, probably because it confers uh, protection or resistance to African sleeping sickness. And I can go through the molecular biology, but it is a great story. But probably explains why this, these, these mutations, which so profoundly predispose to risk of renal disease, have been maintained in the African population. The, um, and it's true whether you look at Africans in Europe and in, in North America, it's really quite striking. So what are the current uh, direction for our research? First of all, certainly characterizing the T cell to epithelial cell synapse. This is, a, this is an important concept in immunology as well. The fact that cells, when they join these synapses, there's a lot of exchange of material back and forth. Certainly one, one is the exchange of virus. Because obviously, if those molecules are different and unique, that might be another opportunity to interrupt uh, transfer of virus from a T cell to an epithelial cell. But I think one of the really important questions is what is the potential for the kidney to serve as a long-term reservoir for HIV? So let's say all of the cure initiatives look very exciting. Um, a number of years down the road, will virus come back? And will it be because the kidney is a reservoir that you can't, you can't clear a virus? When you think of renal epithelial cells, they turn over very slowly. So there have been a couple of really interesting case reports. I don't know if you're following. A lot of this is in the lay press of potential cures for HIV. So one was a German patient that got a bone marrow trans transplant from a patient who lacked CCR5, the major co-receptor for HIV. So that's kind of easy to understand. You, you put T cells back into a patient that you can't infect. That patient has stayed, quote, cured now for a number of years. As in preparation for that transplant, he also had very high doses of radiation. So the idea is you kill all his T cells, you put back in T cells that are protected. Um, you don't have that T cell to propagate and pass the virus back and forth. So that's one case. Um, then there was a pediatric case reported a year and a half ago of an infant um, whose mom was lost to care and didn't take antiretrovirals. The baby's first blood test at the time of delivery was indeed positive, was put on antiretrovirals in, in a very short period of time, and within a, within a year or two, they could not detect virus in that baby. Well, that I would, would characterize as very, very early therapy, which generally we do not have an opportunity to do. And then there was a series that was prematurely reported out of Boston, which happens a lot, um, of other bone marrow transplant recipients not getting bone marrow from um, donors that lacked the co-receptor, but patients who received a lot of radiation in preparation for bone marrow transplant who appeared to have no evidence of the virus, but they were on antiretroviral therapy. They had a lot of chutzpah. They came back after two years and stopped therapy. I think that's a little risky, and sure enough, the virus came back. So that's pretty good evidence that even if you you think you kill all the infected T cells by very high dose radiation, there are other reservoirs. We would propose the kidney as one of them. Certainly the brain um, is a well-recognized reservoir. And a lot of these approaches wouldn't effectively clear those sites. So, so this is one of the biggest areas of HIV RFAs is understanding the different reservoirs um, for HIV. And the other biggest area is understanding what I would call accelerated aging that occurs in the presence of HIV. So in the case of what we're looking at is accelerated chronic kidney disease, but I would argue cardiovascular disease is probably going to be a bigger clinical impact. Um, clearly, a lot of epidemiology has shown that in comparable risk factors, and that's always difficult to do because normal people don't take antiretrovirals, so that's a big caveat in terms of how you compare cohorts, that the the cardiovascular events occur at an earlier age in HIV-infected individuals, even, even those that are well-controlled. So what are some of the current hypotheses? Or the kind of the simplistic one is that the gut never recovers 
even in patients that are on really good antiretroviral therapy. You have a major alteration in, in lymphocytes in the gut. You have a breakdown of the gut barrier, and you have high circulating levels of LPS. So a simple model is it's a chronic inflammatory model, even under the best of circumstances. Uh, it's a bit simplistic because not everybody has measurable LPS. But the chronic inflammatory model, increased IL-6, does appear to be part of, of this. But understanding why patients that are very, very well controlled have evidence of progressive end organ disease is going to be a very important part. And so there's a number of RFAs that have come out very recently um, addressing that issue. And then certainly understanding the link between HIVAN and APOL1. Um, I would propose that many, many issues that have been studied because of HIV have opened up other fields of research, and that's certainly the case for APOL1. APOL1, it turns out to be really the number one risk, genetic risk background for a large number of chronic kidney diseases. So obviously, that's a, a huge focus in terms of understanding that. The other thing we've been very interested in, um, you can't do multiple biopsies, you can't even do single biopsies on patients anymore, is developing urine biomarkers to be able to at least follow the virus, if not follow kidney disease uh, with more sensitive markers. And so one of the things we've been doing in the lab is developing techniques to be able to use the urine as a way to look at the kidney. So our first um, attempts were looking at renal epithelial cells. We occasionally got a positive. We stepped back and said, well, let's just get large volumes of urine and ultracentrifuge and see if we can find virus in the urine. And sure enough, we can. So what I'm showing here is a number of patients we've just simply looked at large volumes of urine, ultracentrifuge the cell-free virus out, looked at the sequence, compared it to PBMC, and just like in the kidney, you can see that virus in the urine looks different than virus in the blood, suggesting that the urine may be a way to follow this reservoir long term. So how might that be helpful? Well, if we had the urine from the patients that got the bone marrow transplants in Boston, we could then get the sequence. You compare that sequence to the plasma sequence that, that relapsed, and if it looks closer to the urine than the blood, you could say, that's probably where it came from. And that would really be very convincing evidence that this is a reservoir that can reactivate, and you need another strategy um, if you want to eradicate that. So this gives us a tool to be able to, to look at that kidney without actually biopsying that kidney. So with that, that that's just kind of giving you a sense of where we are now. Um, I'm going to put a plea out for looking at the HIV RFAs. They're coming out like crazy. Um, Obama announced a couple of weeks ago he's putting another $100 million into cure science. And you can, you can really broaden the net of, of science in HIV. It's not necessarily molecular virology. A lot of it's epidemiology. A lot of it's looking at traditional risk factors for disease and seeing what they look like in the setting of HIV. So, so we've already got some of our cardiology colleagues looking at this. Um, I've been very, very lucky to have a wonderful group of collaborators, not the least of which was my husband. Um, we still talk to each other after 30 years and collaborating for 14. Um, but this has been a real uh, team effort and a, and a fun effort. The best part of, of this PPG is we're very proud of the fact that we've had five KO8s and four of those five are now R01 investigators, and I, I think that's a plea for team science, which you guys know, um, but it really has been quite gratifying. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and be glad to take questions. Thank you. While others are getting their questions together, first of all, thanks, Mary, for coming to speak with us. and, and uh, and uh, pushing us forward because it's an amazing story. So I, the question I have for you is, so you, you, you're provide a convincing story about the fact that 50% of the high van can be, you know, basically accounted for by the combination of, um, of genetic risk. And so the question, the obvious question to me is, is there other triggers, other hits uh, that you've identified along the way that are perhaps ca uh, shared cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension or other things that that you've been able to understand the relationship between high van and, and those risk factors? I think there's going to be. So in the mouse model,
Now they probably have an equivalent, but in these laborious crosses that we've done, we have isolated genes that increase the risk, and we've isolated genes that decrease the risk. And I think that, that array of genes are gonna give us a good opportunity to ask questions like that. So, so there's a primary risk, which is APOL1, but not everybody with HIV and APOL1 gets high band. So is that a protective allele um, or is that an environmental um, issue? So yeah, I think there are clearly other risk factors and some of them are probably gonna be broader than whatever the APOL1 intersection with renal disease is. For instance, some of the inflammatory markers. So we're, we're looking at some of the chemotaxis markers. So I think yes. And the second question, very uh, selfish question, is in that high van uh, group, particularly the ones with APOL1, was there any evidence of, of cardiomyopathy or any uh, associated other end organ uh, damage that was has been found along the way? Well, in the the um, autopsy cohort, yes. I mean, th but those were patients that died of HIV, so they had PML, they had end stage lymphoma, so they were very very sick. Um, as you probably know, early on in the epidemic, there was there there was thought to be a primary cardiomyopathy. And that has never been clear that that was a real direct association with HIV. A lot of the tools used to find the virus, like antibodies, originally cross-reacted with a lot of cell proteins. So there hasn't been any real direct evidence of infection of myocytes, for instance. So I think that it's still out. Pulmonary hypertension is a real primary manifestation of HIV. Again, we don't understand the pathogenesis of that. Um, I think the intersection between CKD and cardiovascular disease is going to be a long inflammatory pathway route. I, I just think it's too simple to say it's LPS. We find L IL-6 is elevated, that may give us a hint. So, so Eric, look at our next speaker. <laughs> he, he was here, I think he would be asking the question like, he's always saying like, what's the point of these mouse models and stuff? <laughs> Too bad he's not here. I'll be provocative in his absence. So, so because in certain cardiovascular diseases, I think the the animal models really have not been terribly helpful to to replicate the complexity of the human situation. But it seems to me is that you've made a pretty good case that they really were pretty helpful here in sorting out some of the pathophysiology and identifying. Where the virus was and how it interacted with the um, with the with the um, tubular disease and whatnot um, is is that the case or do you think some of this could have also been identified through more systematic um, kidney biopsies in humans or what's been so I guess the question is what's been the role of the mouse model in has that been a critical piece am I interpreting so the you first correctly? answer to the one technical piece was critical, and it's a simple piece. So we, when we got you know the transgenic and looked at the kidneys and said, Geez, it looks like high van, but everybody kept reporting no virus in the kidney. I thought, well, this is very bizarre. Um, we must be doing something wrong. And so some of it has taught us how to biopsy and handle biopsies from the kidney, because it turned out what we, what we practiced in the, in the Murray model was we did timed preservation of the kidney and found that if we waited an hour or two, the RNA would degrade, viral RNA degrades very easily. So when we applied that to our protocol, and literally went to the biopsy suite, stood there with our paraformaldehyde, didn't cross-link it too much, did all those steps, we found RNA. So that's a technical. But the other is really that the pathogenesis absolutely worked out. And I think it's because in this disease, it's simply the viral proteins cause the disease. And so we got lucky. So the host response, all that, very little part of it. If you express the viral proteins in the kidney, you get the disease. And so that allowed us to model the whole disease. So every time we got something in tissue culture, what I'd, which I'd say is kind of the crudest model, we could then go back to the transgenic model and it always followed signaling pathways. I didn't go into any of the, the molecular <clears throat> pathogenesis, but I think it's because it's a fairly simple disease. And if you, if you have the risk, and in mice, the risk allele is a little different. 
But if you have the risk and you express the viral proteins, you get the disease. So I, I think we just got lucky. Could we have found it in the human biopsies? The problem is that you get so little tissue. And we used to have to beg. We actually had a protocol that allowed us a second pass, which not every site will. Um, you couldn't do a lot of this work. Would after 15 years we decide to treat with antiretrovirals? Probably. Would have taken us probably about five more years to say, of course. It's the virus. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. This was a great presentation. I have a quick question for, for you. I think um, you certainly made the case for skipping a clinical trial in what you presented, but isn't there a room for a clinical trial that compares different retroviral uh, regimens, you know, to see which one is better, and is there anything planned in, in that arena? So there hasn't been a prospective trial where, we, you know, that it's set up to say, let's look at this versus that. A lot of retrospective look at tenofovir, and then that's a separate issue. So tenofovir has renal toxicity, no matter what Gilead tells you. Um, and so there's been a lot of looking at different combinations to really address that issue. And I think the data are pretty compelling. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a low level risk, but it's there, it's real. Probably nephrologists can tell you more. Um, but it, it wasn't done with a prospective uh, protocols. That issue is very important, by the way. And, and so my somewhat concern now is tenofovir is used as a prevention as opposed to therapy. So therapy, you're willing to take risk, right? You've got 100% fatal disease, you know, it's a little renal toxicity. But, but tenofovir is a very effective prophylaxis. Um, and you know the whole uh, principle of treatment as cure, as, a, as prevention. That's a different goal than treatment as cure. And so the, the issue of tenofovir toxicity then is elevated quite a bit. So that's being looked at all the time. Um, but nobody's ever said, is there a better protocol for high band? They all seem to work. Dr. Klopman, that was a good talk, <clears throat> great talk. Um, I hope Dr. Granger's wrong because I killed a lot of those mice in Dr. Lifton's lab when I was a med student, so hopefully <laughs> something good came out of it. Um, if, the HIV, if the virus has such a good affinity for um, the kidney, can we use it for uh, gene uh, transfer or gene therapy? I would think so, but I'd use VSV pseudotype virus for even better, because we've used VSV pseudotype and it's even more efficient. And the, the one caveat about getting the virus into the kidney is it requires that cell, cell. So it could be cell free. Cell free is very, very inefficient. But via VSV pseudotype, I can talk to you, we have a whole vaccine protocol with a highly engineered virus with VSV. Works very well, actually. What do we know about the renal reservoir in the Berlin patient? In terms of, I don't think he ever had a kidney biopsy. Now so we we have asked, I've asked the Boston group for the urine because I sure, but I like, mean the same. But that, that patient never had a, a kidney biopsy. Your hypothesis, based on both animal and human data that we've seen, is that there's still virus in 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 um, carcerated in uh, renal epithelium? Yeah. Now, he's Caucasian, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't expect him to get high band. But you also wouldn't expect, the, again, because you've got to have the synapse of the virus going back and forth. If the T cells can't support the virus replication, yeah. then it might be a, a, a dead end replication cycle. But having the biopsy would be wonderful. But I don't believe I seen anything on a kidney biopsy on that patient. Would love to see it on the, the, the urine on the patients sure. that did reactivate. Dr. Klopman, I'd like to ask you, it was a fantastic presentation, um, and I think we need to see that sort of thing at the Clinical Research Institute because sometimes we forget that clinical observation is really critical and that we combine it with science, it's, it's really powerful. But I'm very interested, um, I remember when you gave a state of the Department of Medicine talk a couple of years ago when we were all concerned about smaller numbers of people going into internal medicine. Um, you obviously have maintained a very vibrant research program while being a chair of the department and really excelling. Most in of this was before I was chair. <laughs> <laughs> but what would you say to the young people in the room in terms of the possibility of, of doing it all, of having that much involvement in your research and still doing clinical medicine education 
of First of all, what, what you failed to note is I spent seven years at the NIH. So what I always tell them is you've got to take the time to train, whether it's clinical research or basic research, which I call a detour. Um, and that was pretty critical, and that was a lot longer than I thought. But the, this, the sec second aspect of, of this work is what you guys do every day. This is a team. I mean, this is, you know, a real team. And um, none of us could have done what we did without having four different institutions, lots of scientists, lots of trainees. Um, that's very different from R01 science. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that. I mean, that's, that's what I really get my biggest thrill out of. Um, so I, I think finding a good team to be a member of, I, and I tell them not everybody has to be the PI, I really do believe that, that many people have contributed to our project that are not the PIs and they've done fine, um, as long as they can, can articulate what they contribute um, to a project or to a, a big team, I think that's really important. Um, and the other great part is when you love the clinical side of what you do and the science goes along with it, um, we can always tell this story. And I think that's the physician scientist um, side of it, which I've loved, is that having done all that training, I was able to go back to the clinical setting. East Harlem was the biggest zip code of HIV patients in Manhattan. And then being able to study something in the context of a clinical cohort where it really was a significant disease is very gratifying. So lots of different elements to that. Uh, but I think you guys know that here. I mean, that's what you do every day with your clinical trials. It's helpful to talk about it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me.